Now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, J.D. Hickey, who is president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, a nonprofit health plan serving more than 3 million members. J.D. has an unusual background for a health plan CEO, having previously led Tennessee's Medicaid program known as TenCare. Then Governor Phil uh, Bredesen tapped J.D. to turn around TenCare and to control the soaring cost and try to preserve the coverage. J.D. led that effort successfully and uh, um, I think is very proud of the work that he did on that. Prior to that, J.D. was a consultant, uh, was a partner with uh, McKinsey and Company. He continues to be a champion for the residents of Tennessee as CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And we're so pleased to have him with us today. J.D. Good afternoon. So I've got the privilege of telling you about Tennessee's new Employment and Community First program. Before I do, I just want to give you a little, a little history a little background in Tennessee on why this is so important. So there's a number of reasons why when we think about the future of healthcare, we should be focused on the highest cost populations. So one of them obviously is that's where the money is. If you look at Medicaid, that's now a 70 million person program. It's the largest federal healthcare program by enrollment, over $350 billion worth of expenditures. But if you look at it, you've got 20% of that population, less than 17 million people who are responsible for 70% of those expenditures, about $245 billion. And it's that senior and disabled population in the middle. The second reason to focus on these, on these populations, particularly, by the way, if you look at the two top bars, when you talk about the institutionalized group, the efficiencies are so high, the spending levels are so high, it gives you lots of room to innovate. You can provide a lot of hands-on uh, care in a small setting and stay below that $106,000 uh, benchmark. The, the last reason, and probably the, the most important one, is healthcare is one of those perverse industries where our mo most loyal customers, uh, our biggest, highest spend uh, individuals in any given year, are also our least satisfied. And it's not because they have health needs, it's because the quality of care is so low. Uh, and if you particularly talk about the Medicaid institutions, the care levels in some of those have been so low for so long that you've got people demanding and, and asking for change literally for decades. So I'm going to take you back in time. I'm going to go back to 2006 in Tennessee. Uh, this is a Medicaid program that simply wasn't focused on home and community-based services or long-term care at all. It wasn't that they didn't pay for them. They did. They had for years. But accessing the, accessing the services was so difficult, and the services were so piecemeal, it just wasn't enough, uh, obviously, if you look at the data, to overcome the natural profit drivers that were sitting out there in inpatient and institutionalized care. I, I can be hard on this program and this leadership team because I was Medicaid director uh, in this window, and it, it wasn't that we didn't care, it wasn't that we weren't aware, but we had so many other things on our plate, we simply, sadly, weren't capable of the systematic, uh, comprehensive reform that this uh, type of spend pattern demands. I, I will tell you an aside, a telling aside, it was early in 2006 uh, that we got protested uh, by uh, ADAPT, uh, rightfully so. Uh, again, if you look at the numbers, that's a disability rights protest group. They actually came and handcuffed our doors uh, and locked us into our building, and I can remember looking down from the fourth floor with my management team as the protest group paraded uh, in front of our group, and they were dragging an effigy of our long-term care director behind one of the wheelchairs. And about the time they lit it on fire, uh, my long-term care director saddled up. I, my, my recollection is we never made eye contact. And he leaned in and he said, JD, I put my resignation on your desk. Uh, and I leaned back and said, I think it's about time. And I, I've often thought it was, it, there's no more pure example of democracy in, in action. Um, so, so the, thankfully, there were people who were capable of that systematic structural reform. It came after I left, uh, but the long-term care director who followed that individual, his name is Patty Killingsworth, she's still with the Bureau, one of my personal heroes, uh, she came up with choices. Uh, what, what makes choices so unique is that, uh, or it was certainly unique at the time, it was a systematic comprehensive set of HCBS benefits uh, integrated that was available statewide. It had a single point of entry, and importantly, it was all managed 
managed through a managed care structure that was fully incentivized, fully capitated, with a really strong financial incentive to try to keep people out of institutional care. If you flip forward to 2014, you can see the dramatic results uh, that, are in, that, are, that are in the data. Um, and this is, this is a national story to a degree. I believe 2014 was the first year where HCBS overtook institutional spend overall across the nation, but no state improved as fast or as dramatically as Tennessee. And I will tell you, as a, as a managed care CEO, we were not good at this at first. If you think about the skill set required, it is as fundamentally different from claims adjudication as you can possibly get, but it is a core competency for us now. We've got hundreds of nurses. They don't do anything except work out of members' homes. Uh, they provide meals. Uh, they do wellness checks. Uh, they oversee uh, home modifications. They provide pest control services. And if you think about the demographics, if you think about the geography of this program in Tennessee, we've got nurses going into some of the toughest neighborhoods, some of the most remote uh, geographies in Tennessee. And to, together, collectively, I'm very proud to say that we're, we're changing lives for the better. You'll, you'll also notice we're saving money. For those of you who saw the quick at math, uh, the total long-term care spending budget from 2006 to 2014 actually went down uh, by $12 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that's not typical for a federal health care program, as you can imagine. Over that same window of time, uh, the TenCare budget went up by 50 percent, and I think the enrollment went up by 15 to 20 percent. So it's a, it's a tremendous accomplishment. I've always had that nurturing personality. And I just feel like that I've been blessed with being able to serve others and letting them know that I'm there. It's great to know when we've made a difference in someone's life and that it's made a better place for them. Because a lot of our people that we see are in a bad situation sometimes, and sometimes we can change that. We go out to see these members in their home, and we sit down and visit with them and just make sure that they're getting what they need. They get to feel like you are their family because we may be the only visitor they have outside of our provider. Each and every time we see them, we encourage them and let them know that we think they can get better. I mean, I'm sure that that gives them a peace of mind to see that they are living a better life and to see the relief in the members and their families' faces is priceless. Looking ahead, the same rock stars in the Ten Care Bureau who came up with the Choices Program have come up with a new program, Employment and Community First. Uh, these are for individuals with intellectual dis disabilities. These are individuals who have a serious cognitive impairment. It's been present since infancy or, or birth. Uh, and in Tennessee, most states have an asset uh, requirement. In Tennessee, it's $2,000, and you can think about that number for a minute. Uh, we've got over 6,000 individuals in Tennessee who meet those criteria, who've been on a wait list for services, in some case for decades. Uh, that's not unusual. Uh, nationwide, that number's probably somewhere above three to 400,000, and that's of the in intellectually disabled that we know about. By some estimates, over 50% of people who meet those qualifications uh, aren't known to the state system, and if you think about being on a wait list for decades, you can, you can understand why. There's a, there's a couple of things that really make this story even more pressing. One is the majority of these individuals live with a family caregiver who is going to age beyond the capacity to provide care over the next 10, 10 years. And it's estimated that two-thirds of those families don't have a plan in place for what happens when that primary caregiver passes away or becomes incapacitated. Another real pressing uh, part of this story uh, is, the, is, the, is the lack of employment opportunities, which is core to this program. Uh, over nearly 70 percent, excuse me, of the intellectually disabled uh, are unemployed. That's, that was true in the 1970s and 80s, and sadly it is still true today. The, the way the current system works in pretty much every state is the only way to get off a wait list is to have a crisis, usually culminating in the emergency department. If you think about that, that is a setup for institutionalized care. Uh, the good news, by the way, one of the silver linings here is most states over the last 10 to 20 years have shut down their big state-run institutions. We've got 30 years of very good data that says individuals are happier, they're healthier, they report more control over their lives if they live in a smaller setting. But being placed in the community is not the same as being part of the community, and having meaningful employment is a big, a big part of this. 
Uh, I won't go into detail, but the program is structured around three tiers of support. We've got waiver approval for 1,800 individuals in the first part of the program. There is a specific uh, part of the program that's tailored specifically for those developmentally disabled who are coming and graduating out of the school system. If you think about it, that's a particularly dangerous time for many disabled as they disappear from the system entirely. A couple things I will add. If it seems expensive to provide tens if not hundreds of hours of home-based care, remember that $106,000 institutionalized benchmark on the first slide. The other one I would say is this is great work. We're, we are privileged to be a part of it, uh, but this is not charity work for us. This is big business. This is a new program, uh, but the Choices program that I talked about a minute ago, we've got revenues well over $500 million a year. Uh, we earn a very respectable margin on it. It's a very important part of this story being as, uh, as sustainable as it is. I'm gonna close with a profile of, of Ryan, his grandmother, Kim, uh, and his care coordinator, Kristen. Uh, Ryan is one of our first ECF members. He lives in Red Bank. He's an Olympian. Uh, he he uh, has two jobs. He works in a grocery store and at Walmart. Uh, what does he want? He wants a promotion. He'd like to get paid well enough in one of these uh, jobs that he doesn't have to try to uh, juggle two of them. He'd like to date. Ryan would like what we all want. He, Ryan wants what we, what we all want for our families. I was on the wrestling team through high school. I was a part of a football, I was a football manager for my high school too when I was in school. We had a Lord Ray Smith golf tournament and it was a full man select shot, which I ended up having it my own team, which was me, my dad, and one of my friends and his partner. We came in first place in the third flat. They say I work hard, that there was there was more people out there that would that was like me that would be able to work like I do. Being able to drive, getting a promotion at work, and getting my own, being able to get out and get my own place. I'm wanting to live out on my own, where I can meet other people around my age. Maybe dating after I get used to driving. I want to be treated the same way other people would like to be treated. And this is Kristen. Kristen's one of our new employees. She's a 20-year uh, experience as a family care supporter in the intellectually disabled community. Uh, if you think about it, we've got um, 6,000 people who work for Blue Cross of Tennessee. We're really good at wellness. We're really good at claims adjudication. Uh, but we don't have anybody, or we didn't before this profile, uh, before this program, who fits Kristen's profile. If you check back in with us a few years, I think we're exceedingly optimistic. Uh, this is going to become a core competency for us. It's going to be big business, but most importantly, Importantly, we hope to change lives and save some money. Thank you.